All right, we are now recording. So welcome everybody. This is our demo from Mr. Matt Day up in Massachusetts. He's gonna walk us through his process for bowl carving. Uh, as you're, I'm sure, well aware, he is the profferer of our template for spoon challenge number 21. So welcome, if you're just signing in, uh, this will be a demo uh, by Matt of the bowl carving process. Please make sure you leave yourselves muted, but if you do have a question, feel free to unmute and ask your question, or you can type it into the chat if you want me to, to ask the question on your behalf. Either way is fine. Um, so uh, Mr. Matt Day is quite an experienced carver and a long time rise up and carver. We're really, really excited to have him doing this uh, demo. Welcome, Matt. Thanks, Chuck. Thanks everyone for signing on and uh, everyone listening for all our Europeans that are already asleep. Um, I'm going to bring up a few screen shares and I'm going to start kind of at the end um, just to know where we're, uh, where we're heading. If it would work, there we go. So um, I do about three different sizes of kind of meal bowls, I call them. And, um, I actually learned to carve um, from Danielle Bird, so I can uh, uh, have her to blame. Uh, but uh, you know, also a lot of you know influence from Dave Fisher, and I saw Peter Follinsby carve and a, a demo um, in the past. Uh, it was actually Dave Fisher's recent article in Fine Woodworking that started me exploring kind of smaller bowls. I'd done a lot of the Scandinavian typical, you know, pith up or pith down, and you know, larger ones. And he did an article with a, a round dinner bowl. Um, and I experimented with that. I decided elliptical um, was a little more satisfying to me because if you got a round bowl really perfectly done, then you just look like you turned it on a lid. Um, so ellipses to me, at least, you know, gave the gratification of, uh, you know, uh, it, it wasn't just spun, not just spun, you know, there's beautiful work that way too, but you're carving it, you know, to get a different shape. So I've kind of stayed with different sizes of ellipse. Um, you can see the different, you know, textures you can start to explore on the outside. This is more of a spiral um, approach where, where you're kind of coming up and spinning around the whole thing. Um, which is actually really tricky because the, the grain changes on you. So some of these you have to carve from the top and some from the bottom. Um, so I wouldn't recommend starting here, but um, you know, you could also get crazy. Here's a, a, a cherry set that I use the difference between the heartwood and sapwood to kind of change the texture between them. You know, I outlined the, the grain line with a, a V gouge and then did the the texture in the inside and, and left it smooth on the out. Um, another shot of that spiral one. I think the, the benefits of these small ones are you don't really have to tool up for them. Um, you know, you definitely can get by with the two templates without an ads. Um, you could even get by on the small one, especially if you made it a little shallower um, with a uh, with a hook. You know, it's no worse than a, than a ladle. Um, but hopefully this gives you a little idea and you can leave the outside smooth. I do that most of the time on my small ones just to kind of keep the price point down, keep them a little simpler. Um, but, you know, you definitely can do very regular patterns like these flutes or, or things that are more irregular like the ones in the background. And um, then, you know, you could go even smaller than my small template. I made a couple because the scraps you know you don't need as much length as with a, a spoon so sometimes those scraps on the side of things really can become a, a a tiny little bowl that that's barely two inches across um so you can kind of just go with it um beautiful work really beautiful work matt yeah i mean i make big bowls too but you know we, we were focusing on the small ones so the the small template um is, is this size with the um, with the lip balm in it, and it goes about a, a half cup if, if you're getting into the depth uh, I do. But again, we could definitely go less if you're just on a hook knife. The medium one, um, I get to about a full cup, just you know, to know what you're, what you're shooting for. 
I like to start with a pretty flat surface, you know, it gets you a head start at the end on a flat rim, um, but you don't have to get here. You know, I would hew out a piece. I like to, for these, get two, three, four, you know, even five pieces. I'll mix sizes on a larger log um, because then you can kind of scoot in a small one in between two medium ones or really make some efficient use depending on, you know, what type of, um, equipment you're going to use to to saw them apart what what size of log are you would you say you're starting with to do both either the small and then the medium in terms of diameter before you split it and then like after you flatten that top curved surface yeah well this one i mean you can this can be the the middle of the log okay and you can use the the curve kind of to to get you halfway there so okay. the um the medium one is only four or five inches across. So I think you could do it with a five inch diameter log and do them right down the middle. Okay. Now you can start to do, you know, you could play with just like a spoon grain. If you, mm -hmm. if you have a five inch log, you're gonna get the concentric circles like you would on a spoon like that. And actually as it dries, you'll get more Kind of play in the rim it'll almost fold in on itself and you'll get a very curvy rim here okay. you see it's you know more of a um you know more of a, a a radial cut this was i think from a larger log and this okay. is like the left side and you'll get yep. much flatter much straighter grain you know something more like an emmet spoon um you know so you, know, you could start to play with grain here too you can flip it the other way um, and that was those cherry bowls, the sun and moon ones, yeah. um, were, were flipped the other way because it was a large enough to kind of have the, um, the bark on top and okay. then look at that typical hourglass shape. So you can do the same kind of grain approach, um, but the small ones are what? The small ones are only three and a half inches across. So, I mean, anything for a spoon, I think you can squeeze a large cooking spoon, you can squeeze in a small one. Okay. And you'll actually yield, you know, what you would get for a large cooking spoon. You could probably fit two to three of the small ones on a blank that size, just because of the handle size. Nice. Um, you can do it with a hook, like I said. I've done all my bowls, and I'm probably at like my somewhere in my 200th bowl, getting close to me. Um, I've done it with these three gouges. Um, I have a fourth one that I bought and then never used. <laughs> You know, it was too flat and too big. Um, and I only added this last one recently on George's recommendation and, and it's been great. Um, if you were just gonna get one gouge, I would say this middle one, this seven, eight, 718 bent, um, you know, it, it, it's curvy enough that you can make some texture at it, but it's flat enough that you can get a pretty, you know, nice inside of a bowl. For an eating bowl, I don't put a lot of texture on the inside, enough to know it was carved, but not so much that, you know, um, you, you can't clean it or, 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 or like that. Um, an eight sweep that's small, I, I use the most for texturing. Um, I went with all of them bent, so I could just make efficient use on inside or out. A straight gouge is much better on the outside. So if I if I were to redo my set for bowls this size, I'd probably do um, the two ones on the right and a straight version of the one on the left instead, because I use that mostly on the outside, not the in. Um, the 825 or 830 on the right, that's a roughing tool. If you don't want to get nads or can't get an ads, you know, an ads will cost you two, three hundred. This will be 70 bucks, 80 bucks. And you can hog away almost as much as with an ads, frankly. Um, you can really well on that thing and, and make chips fly. Um, so, so what do you use then for your finished surface inside the bowl if you're the looking seven. to get it, the seven? Yeah, the 718. And even the smallest bowl is 718. Um, the most difficult part on the inside is the bottom. Um, a hook knife on these small are great because you can reach to the bottom and use a hook knife to kind of sweep across the grain. I ended mm -hmm. up adding a bowl bottom gouge recently, you know, a swan neck or something like that. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, a hook knife on these is perfect for the bottom. So seven yeah. on the inside, eight for A25 for roughing. And, you know, on the outside and the smallest ones, you can finish with a straight knife, you could chip carve. 
I, I most often use the, the tiny eight, the eight, 10 on the left there for texturing. And I'll, I'll show a texture, my kind of one I'm playing with lately. Cool. Um, why don't we, well, let me go through all of this just for the camera yeah. switching. You know, work holding's tough. Um, that's probably the piece that gets most people. The fact that you're ganging them up long like this can really work well. You could put a, a ratchet strap on your carving stump over one end of it and give you access to another. Um, you can do one of the more bowl style carving stumps that have, you know, cuts on the end and I'll show you mine um, and use wedges in there. Um, I do traditional woodworking too, furniture making. So I have a bench here that I'm sitting at and I ended up doing this kind of twin screw approach with a beam across. And, and that's probably what I use most often. And, you know, it doesn't, you can scoot it out front but you can also um, go work over it to do the outside. Uh, mm. These are, if you Google veneer screw vice, um, they're like 20 something bucks on Amazon. You know, it's a two by four in between and you could even put dog holes like this on your carving stuff block. You know, if you have a, a, a long grain carving block um, and, and get, a, get around with this. Um, so that's probably the most useful and it you know it's it's almost akin to a, you know, a mule where you can reposition really quickly like a half turn on either screw and mm -hmm. you can spin the bowl to be working around it and a half turn and you're back to to rock solid um so you know in terms of easy adjustability this has really worked out um well and i use softwood so it won't dent do you know what size holes those work in or those uh, three quarter yeah, um, the dog holes on my bench were three quarter and it worked. I think they'll fit in even something a little smaller. The flange is big underneath, so it gives you a lot of play. And cool. if you don't make it too, too tight, you can end up, you know, working things that are a little wonkier. Um, mm -hmm. you, know, you actually want a bit of play. I think it, it's better. Um, depth, I played with a lot. You know, you'll see Dave Fisher. He puts a uh, a straight edge across it so you can, and then puts a depth gauge down and, and that's great. Um, it takes a lot of time, you know, pausing and seeing am I deep enough, pausing, am I deep enough? I, I ended up moving to where I do a, a, a depth hole at the beginning. I think I should, saw a punk rock shaker do this first, Joel up in New Hampshire. And, um, you know, it just, when the screw, uh, you know, when the lead screw is erased, I know I'm at depth. Um, so, you know, I aim for about a half inch underneath this, um, and I'll scrape maybe to get it a little finer. Um, and, and then you just, you know, have it right there, especially if you're working with a gouge, um, this gives some place for the first chips to go to. And I find mm -hmm. the hollowing really just gets started a lot faster. So I know not everyone does this sort of approach, but once I started, I, I really just was a lot, a lot, lot happier with it. Yeah. So the um, hollowing, I you know, I showed here, you know, with just doing it with a gout with a gouge, and that's that A25, and you can see, you know, with a big a big mallet or a maul or something, you can you can really go at it, and um, you know, this bowl isn't that large anyway, and you just want to keep working around. Um, end grain is going to be tougher. Don't go too deep on one side or you might, you know, blow out the grain on the other, but you just kind of work into the middle, making it down, making it down. Um, and, you know, eventually you can, you can go to, you know, work your way around once, then you work your way around again and you're just getting down to that, to that bottom side. So, you know, nice, nice, nice approach there. I leave a little bit. I don't go right to my lines. You, you find it harder to, start a cut if you can't start it right at the top. So leaving something there for the next cut, you know, kind of always leaving a little bit of your line until your final cuts, um, I, 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 find, I find the best. And then you, you move to, 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 to hand pressure and that'll give a much smoother cut than before. It's a little more control. Um, and you just work your way around again. So you see, I'm now just about erasing those um, marks from the drill. So I know I'm just about at depth. 
without measuring or anything like that. And I'm still just still working with that 825, that, that, that really workhorse. But when you get to pairing, you know, depending on your wood, you really want to start getting over it. And you see it's, you know, it's not coming out of your hands. It's coming at with your whole body. And I definitely have enough body mass, you know, pushing down on it. So you want this kind of low, you know, you really want to get into it. And it's, it's really like an up and down, up and down motion. Um, and, and really locked in with the, with the gouge there. You see, I'm in my dominant hands, my right hand, I'm in with a, um, a dagger grip there, kind of overhand, the other is steadying it, but it's really my whole body that's pushing it down. You'll never get through, you know, anything meaningful with just trying to do it, you know, out of your wrist, out of your elbow. Yeah. And, you know, that's where I, I end at the, the end of it. Um, I do have a bandsaw. I'm not ashamed to say it. I have a bandsaw and I'll use it. Um, but you want to use a jigsaw, you want to use a turning saw, you want to use a coping saw, you want to use your silky, you know, cut them apart at this point. Um, you know, uh, I'm doing this as a hobby that, you know, I also like to dream one day could at least like send me on one vacation. Um, so, you know, I look at a little bit more of a production. I also end up with, you know, some shoulder issues. So this part of axing to get to that back one is not the fun part for me. It's the next part of axing that's fun. So I do this part on the bandsaw and you see, I get it kind of there. Um, mm -hmm. But again, silky, and then you just would ax. You work in the corners, working the corners. Um, I do like putting on the bottom um, before you start axing too much to know where you're going towards. The bottom on these, if you just do a gentle curve, you shouldn't get too thin. Um, you know, I kind of played with that to be small enough that it looks fine, not like a hunk, but, you know, um, large enough that you're not uh, cutting out too much. Hey, quick um, question. Was, yeah. is the, how do you know you've got your bottom aligned with the center at, of the top? So um, you see the little marks that give me the four on the top when when you cut them out you just run them down around with like a square or even by eye i do it by eye and i just square them down the side and then i you know connect them underneath the bottom got it so you see here i connected them at that back one looks like i you know decided i was off a little too much so i made two lines and you know i won't it won't hurt you too much to be off um you know, uh, Kaylin had a great idea to actually, you know, if you're not with a bandsaw to um, ax, leave them together and ax one end each before you separate them. Um, and if you're doing more with an ax, that would definitely be safer and, and give you something to grab onto. Um, I'd rather get, you know, further with the bandsaw that since I have it, but then, you know, just like a spoon, when you ax the first time, you'll probably leave too much uh you know if you remember back to your first spoon and then um you know you'll, you'll start to get that feel for how far you can bring it um you know if you leave too much here the next steps get harder um just like your first spoons the um next step is you know just like a spoon remove the axe mark uh for the small bowls this this could just be with a um with a straight knife you know, the, the, that, that one I size to fit in your hand, it'll fit just like a spoon. You can smooth out your ax marks just like it. Um, again, I, I, I tend to like two-handed tools for ergonomics and efficiency. So I got this little carver's draw knife from Lee Valley. It's wicked sharp, small enough to work. You could put this in that other work holding. You can design a spoon mule jaws for it. Um, wait, again, wait. How, how sharp is it? Oh, Wicked Shop. Wicked Shop. Nice. Wicked Shop. I lie. I'm really from New York, so I, I, I only try. You didn't play up the accent. <laughs> um, I'm trying to talk George into adding a spoke shape to his. It really becomes my favorite tool. Oh, nice. You know, I, I, I have two of these from Lee Valley, one with a flat bottom, one with a rounded bottom. Uh, flat bottom works fine for the outside. I use the rounded more for bigger bowls that have a deeper con concave on the outside. Okay. Um, you can get old ones easily too. Yeah. Um, and then you know we're we're, we're dry. Um, you know, I dry them in a bucket of wood chips. Um, 
you don't have to, you could be a little more, especially with the small ones, you could be adventurous and dry them however you do spoons. They're pretty close. I was getting a lot of cracking. It's really dry in my shop in the winter. Um, so I found once I did that, it takes longer, but I've had almost no cracks. Um, how, how, what's your thickness on the walls again, typically? I said like eight mil and 10 mil. Okay. That was probably a little heavier than in, than in reality, but um, you know, especially for the medium ones, um, you don't want to go so thin if you're going to do a heavy texture. So you got to think a little bit ahead at this point. If you're going to go a really deep texture, you got to figure the bottom of whatever texture you're going in. You know, you still need enough meat underneath that. If you're going to keep them smooth, you could probably skim a mill or two off these. Um, so again, I dry them. I did end up eventually buying a $9 moisture meter from Harbor Freight. Um, I'm sure it's inaccurate, um, but it's consistent. So I know when it says eight in my shop, it's done or done enough to not crack anymore. Uh, I, who knows what the real moisture is, but uh, um, you can also weigh them. Uh, you know, when they stop losing weight, I used to do it with my younger daughter. She'd come out and weigh all the bowls with me and write them on the bottom. Uh, when they stop losing weight, you're, you're done. Um, or, or just feel, you know, I mean, you, if you're an experienced spoon carver, you kind of know when something's dry or not. But um, I, do, I do like the chips, at least for my situation. A small bowl mm -hmm. um, probably takes a week to dry. If you go even larger experiment with like dinner bowls and they were sopping wet to begin with, you know, they could take a month, but you know, somewhere in there. And, um, and then I like to, to decorate, um, especially the medium ones that, that medium size, if you end up with it really fits perfectly in your hand, it holds a cup, which is a good dessert or yogurt, and, you know, the texture, it's the underside of a bowl. So you don't see it a lot. I want something you feel. And it's just, it just feels great holding that and like having your ice cream with your wooden spoon and mm. um, really gives you like this, this real tactile um, response. Uh, so I did a few of that there. So um, I'm gonna stay on this camera, Chuck, but I'm gonna move a camera and we'll do a texture. Okay. Boston, does anybody have any questions for Matt? One question, Matt, that I have when I'm doing the inside of the bowl, when you're working with your gouges, um, to be able to get the right curvature for the inside of the bowl, is that where you're doing kind of that leverage action with your shoulder, but you're allowing the blade edge to come out with the curve naturally? Because a couple of times I think I've started at too high of an angle and ended up a bit straight and then it curves out and the bowl almost has like more of a bucket uh -oh. shape rather than a curve and that bucket shape is crazy hard to finish carve because then yeah. my yeah no, you, you do want to try to add the curve to it and mm -hmm. these uh, these are a little steep on yeah. the sides um but should like end up in a fair curve yeah. um especially on the end grain but but it is on the steep side on the side grain which mm -hmm. you should be able to get a nice curve but um, the steeper you go down the sidewalls, it's hard not to get tear out. Yeah, okay. Um, so what I'll actually do, and I kind of show it on the, the side here, and it's the same idea, the hey, Matt, guidelines. One second, I'm gonna switch the spotlight. No, it's the same camera. No, it's not, because I'm still seeing your shared. Oh, oh, let me stop sharing. It's the same camera, but let me stop sharing. There we go. So um, I don't know if you can make out those lines, but mm -hmm. you know, if you go straight down, this is the sidewall, straight down is very hard to get without tear out. Um, you know, there's really no way to, to, to not do it right here, but I won't keep going. I'll start to kind of cheat it and do it as much of a diagonal as you can. Um, so I'll like, I'll go there and then there and then there. Because if you just do this, you end up getting a lot of tear out. Um, the other thing you could do is even when you do here, you know, a bit of a slicing motion as you pull, as you push on the inside, and that'll help out uh, a bit on the inside. Um, 
but yeah, no, you want to you want to try to get to the right curvature uh, as best you can and not end up with that L. The other thing, um, if you're using feel gouges, mm -hmm. sometimes this hump between the bevel and here is a little too much. And I've kind of sharpened some of the hump away. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing these are notorious for is having a giant micro bevel, like someone got a little too zealous on the buffing wheel. Um, and, and you'll find then you have to go steeper than you want to. Um, so, you know, you can normally see that and it's just kind of like on a, on a, on a spoon knife you know, getting back to that true flat bevel. Um, so try to go back to, you know, pretty coarse. Um, if you've never done it, it's probably on there. And that's probably finding why you have to go steeper. Than that's cool. Yeah. Thank you. Dave Fisher you. has one on that, um, what he does. And he does it with a grinder. I've just, I don't have a grinder. So I've just done it with what I have. So I do um, like to keep myself honest with a few guidelines. I'll go quarters and then diagonals just to kind of keep me in. Cause as you're making, especially irregular patterns, you can end up kind of just bringing it around and then all of a sudden it doesn't resolve well with like the next quadrant. Um, I've been doing, you know, you could do, I, you see all like small flutes. I've been trying to experiment with something that's kind of more speckled, but with a little bit of movement, where just like, you're not going straight down, you're kind of taking a left, taking a right, just a little bit playing with length on it. And um, on this maple, it's coming out nice. I actually um, torch it after and it highlights the uh, the grain. I'm not getting the best focal length on this, but. It looks fine. So. I'll start at the top. I'll try to work this middle section and then that. And here I am definitely um, using my upper body totally. You know, I'm, I'm over it. I'm in that chisel grip. I find, you know, pattern either has to be regular or irregular. You know, it, when you start doing in between, it really it doesn't look right. Um, so this one, you know, I'll play with different lengths of this first course. And um, are you working down the end grain now first? Yeah, yeah, this is, this is the end grain. It was gonna give a nicer cut, so I wanted. So I have that first course. And now I'm gonna work between most of them. Um, so I'm going at the, the little peak between two of them. And this one, I'm gonna curve off to that side. And this one, I'm gonna curve off that way. Same thing over here, I'm gonna curve in there. And you can take two swipes at a, at a, at a go at a certain area. Um, try to cover the whole thing. You know, if I start halfway in, like you always get a little lump in the texture, if, if that makes sense. Just like a spoon, you know, you're going to get a much nicer cut than when it was wet. For folks who are maybe doing their first bowl, um, do you have a recommendation for a good wood species that would be soft enough to carve, but still takes a nice finish? Is that kind of like your birches and your alders? Are there things to avoid for bowl carving that's different from spoon carving for like the grain changes that are hard to clean up or not really? I find the grain a little more forgiving because you're kind of busting through it anyway to, to a huge extent. Um, I don't get a lot of birch. I, when I do, I find it hard to get a good finish. 
Um, just like on spoons, some people say uh, sugar maple will kill you. Um, in my opinion, I've done a bunch of beach that also I always regret and, and half the time give up before I do the finish cuts. Um, this is Norway maple and, and it is one of my favorites. Like the grain is really consistent. It's like hard enough to take a good finish, but not so hard you hate yourself. Um, Cherry is always beautiful, walnut. Um, but, you know, I have a lot of maple around here. It was planted as street trees and now it's kind of dying out. Um, so it's plentiful for me and, and definitely is one of my, my favorite um, carving. It could be boring, um, but that, you know, sometimes gives you a good canvas for the texture and gives you a um, chance to play around. So uh, you saw what I was doing with fire. On the on that other one, and the one for the uh, demo itself, the post. Um, also, um, I went even further with the fire on that one. But you know, kind of decide what you want to do, go with it. I think one of the easiest ones is just a um, a scaled where you're doing a row, and then you go right in between. Um, I showed some examples of that at the beginning. End grain is going to be harder to do, easier to get a good finish. Um, the side grain, like I said, you know, this is the one where if you come straight down, it's just really hard not to get tear out. So I'll, I'll kind of do cheating a little bit like, like that. With a gouge this small, it's hard to get much of a slicing action, but you still can kind of move it along the edge with the cut. Um, take a smaller pass and, you know, strop right before you're doing the, the side grain. I do find the side grain to be the most challenging to uh, get where I want it to get. The other approach to is not to have side grain this steep. Um, of the holding tool, oh, the, the screws itself, Jody. And um, yeah, I'll try to find an Amazon link, yeah. Um, not to have the sidewalls this steep, but you know, so you're kind of just, you would do something more gentle, but then it's not a small bowl, so. <laughs> but. That's kind of some of the texturing. Um, kind of any any questions on that part? Otherwise, I was going to go try to do a, a little a little hollowing with an ads in case anyone uh, watching now or later has the tool or wants the excuse to buy it. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm going to change cameras, Chuck. I should try to change audio too. You're saying. Um, yeah, if you're going to switch to the other one, just so that it, I'll, I'm going to remove the spotlight off of this one then. Yep. And I'm going to go back to gallery view. And then when you're on your other one, switch your audio over. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me still? Yep. I can barely hear you guys. So um, I did this one, I did it up with three. This is a small, and these are two of the medium ones. Um, I actually was able to fit a Sebastian spoon over here, but it made it where I couldn't fit it in my block here. I forgot to measure. Um, so I cut that out just so I could try to wedge it a little bit. So this one, I have uh, done the ads already. Um, and, and you kind of see where, where I, I would get it to. Um, this is my ads, um, you know, it, it, bowl ads will not have much of a flat here. The ones where you see that have more of a flat there are, are, are more for like traditional gutter making or chair making. It'll work. Um, but you know, the ones with more of a sweep, especially for, for smaller bowls like this, I find, I find to work well. Um, this is a Nick Westerman. I don't like saying that because he doesn't make them anymore. 
um, <laughs> after his shoulder surgery, and, and I didn't even have to wait that long for it. And the end, the end. I ended up getting it when Danielle taught a class at Lee Nielsen. They had arranged to get like a dozen, and um, somehow I got on that order, even though I wasn't part of the class. Nice. Um, but Ben Ganos was saying, um, you know, you could probably send your kids to college if you ever auction that off. <laughs> I don't want to give up. So, you know, the idea of with the pommel, you know, you kind of grabbing it here, it's a bit of a swing. Um, you know, you want to stand pretty clear and the chips that come out are big. So, I mean, I, I always put on eye protection for that. This isn't a huge bowl though. So you're not, you know, you're not swinging, you know, for the fences. Um, and, and you're just kind of working around that center hole, so. So there's a question in here from Nancy asking, how do you determine the depth of the drilling so that you don't drill through? Um, however, you would do a depth gauge, like a piece of tape around a, the drill bit, or um, if you're on a drill press, you know, the depth gauge there. So measure, measure your thickness of your board, um, how deep you want the bowl. Um, there were suggestions up top, like leave a half inch at the bottom at least. So these medium are two inch bowls. So I'll drill um, like an inch and a half and, um, you know, just put a piece of tape around your drill bit an inch and a half up and it'll give you a good, good start. Never knew how much pressure it'd be to ads in front of people. Right. This is where Matt accidentally whacks into the side of the bowl. <laughs> what was that? I said this is where you accidentally whack the side of your bowl. <laughs> yeah, well, better the bowl than my fingers, right? Well, that too. <laughs> Well, it's pretty amazing how quickly that chips away wood. Yeah, and I, you know, if I, you guys weren't looking at me and I'm getting worried and worried that I'm gonna chop my arm off, I'd uh, go a little further, but that's okay. Um, and then this, I started doing about a year ago after YouTube sent me a video and I'd never really seen anyone do it, but it works and um, it's amazing how much further I can now take the ads and it's put the ads down and use it like a gouge with a mallet. You see working around to go too deep on one side, you just kind of get stuck. So it's kind of moving out in concentric circles. You know how I've seen most people do spoon bowls too. I'm not sure what you were saying over the course of the last minute and a half or so, my internet connection froze and I think it might've frozen for the recording as well. So if, if, if you Do I have anyone else with me? No, we're, we're here. I think it's yeah. just on my oh, okay. end. Yeah, I think, I so, think okay. people have been here. So if, if I could just ask you to okay. repeat it now for the benefit of the recording. Yeah, I don't think it was anything important. So it'll just be like um, a, even a faster ads work. Um, I probably switched over in the last minute or two to using a mallet on the ads, which 
I added a year or so ago after seeing a, a YouTube video of some guy in a British festival somewhere. It didn't look like the Huli, but, um, and I was really just amazed at how you can take the speed of an ads and kind of get to the accuracy of, of a gouge. You know, I'm placing this exactly where I want it and kind of going at it. And we're, we're, we're nearly hollow to where we want it at that point. And that, you know, five minutes of, of hollowing work. That's impressive. Uh, I, it is very unsploity, but a four pound dead blow from Harbor Freight gives a whole lot less strain on the elbow because of the dead blow. Mm. Um, I, I, I did it with the mall and it'll work, but um, I definitely noticed you can get more hitting power with less joint pain um, with the dead blow. Um, so, with this one, I will not swing the ads, the small one. Um, you definitely can use the ads with the mallet just to get going. But this is where, you know, George again has a even bigger one than this. He goes 830. Um, this is 825. It's just all I could find. And for that, the dead blows a little much, but it's the same idea. that starter hole, like I said at the beginning, really just gives your chip somewhere to go. Hey Matt, we have another question in here from uh, Tamir. Uh, do you have any pointers on sharpening an ads or sharpening a gouge? Yeah, that's another thing I just changed recently after the um, workshop book I got for uh, Christmas. Um, so, you know, I, I, I would do it similar to, you know, any else we're trying to you guys get the idea of this. So maybe I'll switch over. Um, let me grab a sharpening stick or something. So, you know, Typical sharpening, you'd try to hold this, you know, hold some sort of sandpaper or something at the right angle, and, you know, and run it over the, the edge, you know, just like you might an ax. Um, Drew Langsner was advocating for curve tools, hold it at the right angle. Put this down on your bench, you know, clamp it with something, hold this at the right angle and then run it along the curvature. And, you know, he was saying, you know, technically you're not sharpening it as well because you're not running as much abrasive over the edge as you would with long strokes. But your ability to hold the same angle as you go back and forth along the curve is just so much greater um, that the increase in, you know, repeatability and of holding the right angle so you're getting a real flat grind is just worth whatever kind of theoretical loss of, you know, sharpening you're getting by not running it over. And I've been getting even better results for, um, with that approach in, in less time. So I, I, this is the typical like Emmett automotive sandpaper. You could just wrap it around a block like, like he does. Um, my wife does paper crafts. So she has lots of fun abrasives and whatnot. And she put four, uh, four grits on, a little piece of um, plywood or something for me. So I have all four grits that I can go pretty quick across them. But. Nice. <clears throat> Matt, I was gonna ask. So, oh. Yeah. Sorry. Um, you did a pretty good job at showing kind of your ads and it looked like you had your leg positioned the same as like if you missed your ad strike, it would be like an ax swing where it would just go past your body. 
Um, I've seen a lot of ads in videos where they'll use their leg to brace the bowl and it seems exceedingly dangerous to me. And it's, it's everyone. It's like Dave Fisher and um, <laughs> people do that. Do you know for ads because of the curvature, if it has less of a likelihood of swinging towards your body? I always add the same way you do with my body positioned away so that it's got a clear swing line. But I was just wondering if you had any tips for people who are new to an ads but who maybe use carving axes, if it's kind of the same body position or if you adjust in a certain way for your swing. Yeah. Um... With these bowls, you know, I find, you know, one reason Chuck and I, when we planned it, you know, I thought these would be great because they're small enough where you can do them up at a height of a carving block. Um, and, and then, you know, it, it, the curvature is kind of right. You can have that more axe-like stance and get away from it. If the bowl is really big, the curve you want won't really work as well standing over it like this you know you'd want to tilt it up and then that gets difficult and that's where you see a lot of them on a low bench with you know in front of them you know this this i could take this whole block off and it becomes and people straddling it and kind of swinging either one hand or two hand towards them um I think you need to get there with larger bowls, but with these smaller, I treat it more like a spoon and try to do it at that height. And, you know, with your typical kind of ax stance and safety, and then you can kind of experiment, you know, as you, as you go further. Um, I don't know that, that, that was my two cents. I, I do more of them up here. Um, the two handed oh. swing never got, 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 got me going. I, I have a feeling with the, the motion and the cutting action of an ads, you're less likely to glance off like you might with an ax on the yeah. outside of the wood. And if you, like, like if it were to not bite into the side where you wanted it to go, it's typically going straight down into the wood. Um, I, I just think there's probably less likelihood of it, it coming back at you. But I would agree that there's more of that if you're actually, if you're adzing something large, much lower down. Yeah, um, and um, true for hollowing, especially Chuck, but yes, a lot of times on the true. bigger bowls too, they'll use the ads in, yeah. um, on the on the tails, you know, if you yep, have a handle point. and then you're doing that and, and yep. that one can get out of, out out from under you. Yeah. Um, so. Good point. Uh, anything else on kind of on the bench people would like to see? I think everyone knows how to axe a, the backside once it was out and um i'm wondering if you ever get tempted to uh, wedge that in place when you're doing it um yes yeah i made this one like a little too long i should have just sawed off the small one but i wanted three to show everyone yeah um and you know if it fit in here i would do a wedge and i'd walk around it that didn't work for this piece was too long and i wanted to stay on one side with the camera yeah, but, but normally, yeah. normally you do it so that you can actually kind of hold it in place somehow. Yeah, I'd wedge this down and okay. I would walk around to get at all the sides okay. um, as was, opposed was... to moving it. I mean, I do like these ends to this um, and, and you can on a piece like this because I left it long, keep my hand out and this is fine for that end. And then I could go over here and come at this side for this end um you know so you, you can get a lot just by stopping it against and the ads somewhat unlike an axe you know the ads is pushing it into this stop over and over um so sometimes if it's a heavy enough block i won't always wedge it if i'm doing a big bowl but for these i do like like you said i'd get it stuck in here and i'd walk around it just uh, okay. wasn't yeah. going to make it wasn't going to make for good video but you're, you're totally I just right yeah, I wanted to make sure it was just something to do with uh, today's specific event, not your normal operating procedure. Yeah. And I think you could see it even when I was trying to do the gouge on this last one, like this yeah. needs to be pinned down because I need two hands more um, when I'm doing the gouge. Yeah. Um, but you guys, you guys get the idea could also throw an F style clamp on that, um, you know, quick action. I'm, I'm not above that. 
either, and then you can kind of get back at it. Yeah, I've also seen like Paul Adamson, like for a cook's a horse and stuff like that. And same for a bull horse, you can drill a couple holes down through for hold fasts and there's yeah. all different sorts of strategies you can use. That's not moving on me. I can, uh, I do like for the first hollowing, even if you're using a gouge for it to be low like this before you brought it up a little higher. Mm. Um, you know, it's just, you're, it's the right height to get over it. You see, even on these small ones with one gouge, you, know, you can get 80% of this stuff out of there pretty, pretty quickly. Um, and the chips are on this are not so much different than what I got with the gouge. So, you know, you definitely don't need to go there. 8.30, if you could get it. I just couldn't find it. Would do even more. But, I mean, that, that's 80% done. Do you find a big difference between a 7 and an 8 when it comes to this stuff for, for hollowing and stuff? Um, you know, I don't have so many that it's hard to compare, like, sweep first size. I'm surprised okay. how much the width actually matters, too. Um, you know, so a 7... A 725 or 30, I think you're going to catch the edge more. Um, this is one that Dave Fisher definitely recommends in his like five gouges to get started. Um, yeah. He has like an 825 or an 832. I think the you know, you're just not going to catch the edge on anything. Yeah. Um, so I would stay eight for these. It's surprising okay. how much difference like seven to eight is and that gouge I never use is a five and like I feel like it might as well be flat um so so you know it's the I think it is a quite a bit of difference between them so that that that's that's bowl making oh, at, right. least little bowl, at least little bowl making um yeah. <laughs> Matt, me. Matt if I could ask a question um yeah have you ever contemplated um, sort of rounding the corners and the gouges off a little bit? I have a little bit on George's um, recommendation. Um, he, he went, he was telling me he went even further. So I've taken, especially on my flatter ones, I just knocked off the corner because if you're ever at the corner anyway, you know, you shouldn't be. So just like the very edge with a diamond stone, he's actually rounded it this way like um with some belly and, and he, he's found use for that on a spoon more we were trying to decide whether it would work for a bowl but you know he 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 did it like that you know almost like a, a you know a like a thumbnail or something yeah, yeah. um so we, we 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 debated it for a long time but we couldn't decide whether that would be good because again i'm using a lot of these tools just because i haven't you know bought so many i'm using them to make the form like here but i'm also using all of these for texture at the end too so you know even if it would work better roughing i, I i'm I, i'd hesitate unless i had a free gouge somewhere because i don't know how it would affect the, the textures i can get from it at the end Uh, Jody, it is the, that one looks close enough to what I got. I got it from Woodcraft, you know, a decade ago. Um, I think we did all the rest of the Q&A. All right. Was that it? Does anybody else have anything? Uh, I think that's it. All right. Then I am yeah. going to... Stop our recording. Thank you very much, Matt. This was most informative. Thank uh, you. That was very informative. Joining in. Yeah. This has yeah, been thanks, this everyone. Been excellent. All right. Thanks, everybody. And so just as a reminder, the show and tell is going to be Saturday, June 5th, right? Is that right, Matt? Saturday, June 5th. I think 5th. so. Oh, well, yeah. I have the template right here. That's what the yep. template says. So yep. Yep, at 8 a.m. Eastern. So we're going back to 8 a.m. Eastern. Apologies to those on the West Sorry. Coast, but Matt's schedule kind of requires it. And um, yeah, so awesome. We'll see you then, and uh, good luck on your bowls, everybody. Cheers. Thanks.
Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Thanks.